What's up everybody? This is VJ from Tech Imaginist. It's been a while. Things were difficult to say the least and I had to take some time off. Well, thank you so much for coming back. Here's hoping that you guys are doing fine and that 2022 is treating you better so far. All right. So I know the title sounds sort of cliched, but hey, I bought the Google Pixel 6 Pro, spent 3 months with it, and here's my verdict. First off, I can say that Google really went back to the drawing board with this one and improved on some of the basics which the previous gen pixels were clearly plagued with. The build quality of the Pixel 6 Pro is excellent, at least on par with the devices available in the market. I'm glad the Pixel finally ditched the gimmicks like the hover control sensors in a bathtub notch or design compromises like coating plastic over metal to add the wireless charging coil. That being said, the design is still nothing to write home about. It features a curved screen and back, meeting the middle with an aluminum frame, some of Samsung's earlier favorites, with the front and back protected by Gorilla Glass Victus. It is a little taller than the Note 20 Ultra with subtly curved 90 degree angles. There's also quite a big band of cameras on the back side and honestly, I like this layout. Albeit the camera bump is bigger and more pronounced than most other phones in the market, the stove and the iPhone included. Now, if you are one of those elites who doesn't like wearing a case, the phone won't wobble on a flat surface. Eh, first world problems. Speaking of which, I really hate the power button and the volume rocker placements. I've always maintained that you should neither try to fix a problem that does not exist nor try to get people to change their muscle memory unless it's absolutely necessary. A few months into the phone, I find what Google has done with the Pixel's interface is somewhat of a mixed bag. I do like how smooth and fluid Android 12 looks on the phone, more so with the 120 hertz screen. You can select themes and color palettes for the interface. The haptics are amazing when you select certain menu options. It just feels like it's vibrating where you touch it. All right, let's not get carried away. <clears throat> yeah, so that's all very nice. But then there are caveats. Your apps drawer just goes with white or black, no background. I know that's a stock Android thing, but that is so old. Even iPhone stopped doing that ages ago. Then they had to shove the whole Google search bar on the home screen which you can't get rid of. It's like a sadistic reminder that you're using a Pixel. <laughs> okay, that might not be an issue for most people. Remember I mentioned the whole muscle memory thing? Yeah, that happens again with the navigation bar. Well, you could use just a navigations which I never really liked on Android. iPhone does it way better. And there's also the old three button navigation for us boomers. but you can't customize where the back and recent app buttons go since i'm right-handed yeah that's my fault and since i hit the back button a lot more than the recent apps button again my fault keeping the back button way over on the left makes me stretch my thumb all the way there with such a big phone in my hand you feel me google doesn't let you switch them up like samsung or oneplus does ah <sighs> i feel so much better letting that out I didn't mean for this to be a rant. While these do look like first world problems, they play a key role in my smartphone experience. I don't feel like installing a third party launcher to enhance this because I'm here for the original experience and I don't have to make myself like the phone if I don't. But feel free to let me know what you think in the comments down below. Let's talk about what the Pixels are most famous for. Their cameras. I went on a small trip around town with the Pixel 6 Pro, the Samsung S22 Ultra and the iPhone 13 Pro Max. Consider subscribing if you'd like to see a long-term review of the other two later. From one camera to the other, there's always some image processing, but I'm not sure if I like the Pixel's way of heavily processing photos after it's shot, giving you an altered version of what you shot rather than get it right in the camera itself. This is of course just my opinion. Let's look at some of the clicks with a side-by-side -side comparison with the iPhone 13 Pro Max. The 
photo from the Pixel 6 Pro has plenty of detail and fares well against the iPhone 13 Pro Max. Overall, the iPhone bumps up the vibrance a bit, but the Pixel does a good job nonetheless. Similar situation here with the Pixel keeping things true to life. Dynamic range is on point. Perfectly resolved detail on both images with the iPhone ramping up the saturation a bit. Let's have a look at the ultra wide shots here. The Pixel seems to be holding its own against the iPhone. The deeper colors on the iPhone does seem to give the scene a bit more punch, but this is down to personal preference. With the telephoto lens, the pixel crops in about four times optical zoom, while the iPhone goes up three times. Plenty of usable detail at this point and the images stay sharp. Now that's a beautiful sunset, and I'd say I like the iPhone's capture of the sky better. The deeper colors and HDR give more character to the scene. The iPhone also manages to capture the outline of the sun, while the pixel darkens out in the viewfinder trying to capture the sun, and then the algorithm just brightens everything in post, losing the color contrast of the rest of the scene. This is pretty much the same thing that happens with the ultra-wide camera. The pixel fares well nonetheless, maybe a notch behind the iPhone, pun intended, in some scenarios. Now, on to some comparisons with certain lighting conditions. This is where the Pixel's post-processing sort of backfires. Not sure what it was trying to do here, but while optimizing the scene, it gave me a washed out shot like this one, which looked nothing like what I clicked. And I clicked the same shot a couple of times, it just gave me the same result. And here's the Samsung S20 Ultra shot for reference on what the scene actually looked like. In the Pixel's defense, this doesn't happen always, but there's a few instances I've come across in my time using the Pixel. At night, the Pixel holds its own. Yeah, pretty much. Photos turn out pretty good with deeper colors and overall better dynamic range than the S22 Ultra. Here are a few other samples at night. I think at this point, we have established that the Pixel 6 Pro definitely has upped its still camera game, giving us the versatile three cameras and competing with the best in the market. But it all somewhat falls apart with video. Videos are somewhat grainy at 4K resolution regardless of lighting conditions. Here's the same video shot on the iPhone 13 Pro Max, which is smoother and maintains better light in the video. Unfortunately for the Pixel, it cannot fix videos post-capture. Putting the chip under fire with some games for a couple of hours, the phone maintains its performance without thermal throttling. Games are smooth and I've tested the usual suspects. All of this in a good day's work, with the battery lasting all day about 6 hours of screen on time, getting home after work with about 40% and dropping to about 10% until bedtime, with moderate usage on Wi-Fi and a 4G network. Now that brings us to the original topic of the video. Why is nobody buying the Google Pixel 6 Pro? Firstly, it runs in the family. There's a considerable amount of bad rep for Pixel phones from the previous generations and that has somewhat deterred people from getting Pixel phones, no matter how much they go on sale. And it goes without saying, when you charge top dollar on a phone, you need to fix the overall experience. The fingerprint sensor on the Pixel 6 Pro is a bit slow and less reliable, even though it's an optical one. We have fingerprint sensors like on the OnePlus that gets it right every single time and with a quarter of the time it takes on the Pixel. The Pixel 6 Pro has been buggy from the launch and with two major updates for bug fixes, they still have not been able to fix the auto brightness issue. Sometimes in a dark room, the brightness just ramps itself up randomly 
and just the opposite when you move into bright light. Now getting everything right is half the battle. Marketing it and making it available is the rest. With Google being such an international presence, you would like to think more people would know about the Pixel. Sadly, that's not the case. The Pixel is still not available in a lot of huge markets like India, Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East. Half the people don't know there's a Pixel phone, let alone spending 900 bucks on it. This availability issue also means that there's no local 5G network support for devices which are imported from the US or other countries. My review device here supported only 4G and did not have Vaulty support, which is voice over LTE. So I haven't had a phone that disconnects from the internet while I'm on a call in quite a long time. But all of that aside, with everything that Google tried to improve this year, this is definitely their best pixel to date, and that's still saying something. It's still a good phone, and if it's supported by your network carrier, getting it at a deal price may still be worth it. But with devices like the S22 Ultra checking all the boxes, Google still has a long way to go in building a near-perfect phone. And make sure to subscribe to watch my review when they do. Now, if that's not a smooth segue to the ending, I don't know what is. That's been it guys. As always, thank you so much for watching.